Section 18 of Select Sermons of Jonathan Edwards. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Select Sermons of Jonathan Edwards. Section 18. The Excellency of Christ, Part 3. Part 3. I would now show how the aforesaid teaching is of benefit to us, in that a. it gives us insight into the names of Christ in Scripture, b. it encourages us to accept him as our Saviour, c. it encourages us to accept him as our friend. a. From this doctrine we may learn one reason why Christ is called by such a variety of names, and held forth under such a variety of representations, in Scripture. It is the better to signify and exhibit to us that variety of excellencies that meet together and are conjoined in him. Many appellations are mentioned together in one verse, Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. It shows a wonderful conjunction of excellencies that the same person should be a son, born and given, and yet be the everlasting father, without beginning or end, that he should be a child, and yet be he whose name is Counselor and the Mighty God. And well may his name, in whom such things are conjoined, be called Wonderful. By reason of the same wonderful conjunction, Christ is represented by a great variety of sensible things, that are on some account excellent. Thus in some places he is called a sun, as Malachi 4.2, in others a star, Numbers 24.17. And he is especially represented by the morning star, as being that which excels all other stars in brightness, and is the forerunner of the day, Revelation 22.16. And, as in our text, he is compared to a lion in one verse, and a lamb in the next, so sometimes he is compared to a roe or young heart, another creature most diverse from a lion. So in some places he is called a rock, in others he is compared to a pearl. In some places he is called a man of war and the captain of our salvation. In other places he is represented as a bridegroom. In the second chapter of Canticles, the first verse, he is compared to a rose and a lily that are sweet and beautiful flowers. In the next verse but one, he is compared to a tree bearing sweet fruit. In Isaiah 53, 2, he is called a root out of a dry ground. But elsewhere, instead of that, he is called the tree of life, that grows, not in a dry or barren ground, but in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelation 2, 7. B. Let the consideration of this wonderful meeting of diverse excellencies in Christ induce you to accept of him, and close with him as your Saviour. As all manner of excellencies meet in him, so there are concurring in him all manner of arguments and motives to move you to choose him for your Saviour, and everything that tends to encourage poor sinners to come and put their trust in him, his fullness and all-sufficiency as a Saviour, gloriously appear in that variety of excellencies that has been spoken of. Fallen man is in a state of exceeding great misery, and is helpless in it. He is a poor, weak creature, like an infant cast out in its blood in the day that it is born. But Christ is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He is strong, though we are weak. He hath prevailed to do that for us which no creature else could do. Fallen man is a mean, despicable creature, a contemptible worm. But Christ, who has undertaken for us, is infinitely honorable and worthy. Fallen man is polluted, but Christ is infinitely holy. Fallen man is hateful, but Christ is infinitely lovely. Fallen man is the object of God's indignation, but Christ is infinitely dear to him. We have dreadfully provoked God, but Christ has performed that righteousness which is infinitely precious in God's eyes. And here is not only infinite strength and infinite worthiness, but infinite condescension and love and mercy, as great as power and dignity. If you are a poor distressed sinner, whose heart is ready to sink for fear that God never will have mercy on you, you need not be afraid to go to Christ, for fear that he is either unable or unwilling to help you. 
here is strong foundation and an inexhaustible treasure to answer the necessities of your poor soul and here is infinite grace and gentleness to invite and embolden a poor unworthy fearful soul to come to it if christ accepts of you you need not fear but that you will be safe for he is a strong lion for your defence and if you come you need not fear that you shall be accepted for he is like a lamb to all that come to him and receives them with infinite grace and tenderness it is true he has awful majesty he is the great god and infinitely high above you but there is this to encourage and embolden the poor sinner that christ is man as well as god he is a creature as well as the creator and he is the most humble and lowly in heart of any creature in heaven or earth this may well make the poor unworthy creature bold in coming to him you need not hesitate one moment but may run to him and cast yourself upon him you will certainly be graciously and meekly received by him though he is a lion he will only be a lion to your enemies but he will be a lamb to you it could not have been conceived had it not been so in the person of christ that there could have been so much in any saviour that is inviting and tending to encourage sinners to trust in him whatever your circumstances are you need not be afraid to come to such a saviour as this be you never so wicked a creature here is worthiness enough be you never so poor and mean and ignorant a creature there is no danger of being despised for though he be so much greater than you, he is also immensely more humble than you. Any one of you that is a father or mother will not despise one of your own children that comes to you in distress. Much less danger is there of Christ's despising you, if you in your heart come to him. Here let me a little expostulate with a poor, burdened, distressed soul. 1. What are you afraid of that you dare not venture your soul upon Christ? Are you afraid that he cannot save you, that he is not strong enough to conquer the enemies of your soul? But how can you desire one stronger than the Almighty God, as Christ is called, Isaiah 9, 6? Is there need of greater than infinite strength? Are you afraid that he will not be willing to stoop so low as to take any gracious notice of you? but then look on him as he stood in the ring of soldiers, exposing his blessed face to be buffeted and spit upon by them. Behold him bound with his back uncovered to those that smote him, and behold him hanging on the cross. Do you think that he that had condescension enough to stoop to these things, and that for his crucifiers, will be unwilling to accept of you if you come to him? Or are you afraid that if he does accept you, that God the Father will not accept of him for you. But consider, will God reject his own Son, in whom his infinite delight is, and has been from all eternity, and who is so united to him, that if he should reject him, he should reject himself? 2. What is there that you can desire should be in a Saviour that is not in Christ? Or, wherein should you desire a Saviour should be otherwise than Christ is? what excellency is there wanting what is there that is great or good what is there that is venerable or winning what is there that is adorable or endearing or what can you think of that would be encouraging which is not to be found in the person of christ would you have your saviour to be great and honourable because you are not willing to be beholden to a mean person and is not christ a person honourable enough to be worthy that you should be dependent on him is he not a person high enough to be appointed to so honourable a work as your salvation? Would you not only have a saviour of high degree, but would you have him, notwithstanding his exaltation and dignity, to be made also of low degree, that he might have experience of afflictions and trials, that he might learn by the things that he has suffered, to pity them that suffer and are tempted? And has not Christ been made low enough for you? And has he not suffered enough? would you not only have him possess experience of the afflictions you now suffer, but also of that amazing wrath that you fear hereafter, that he may know how to pity those that are in danger, and afraid of it? This Christ has had experience of, which experience gave him a greater sense of it, a thousand times, than you have, or any man living has. Would you have your Saviour to be one who is near to God, so that his mediation might be prevalent with him? 
and can you desire him to be nearer to God than Christ is, who is his only begotten Son, of the same essence with the Father? And would you not only have him near to God, but also near to you, that you may have free access to him? And would you have him nearer to you, than to be in the same nature, united to you by a spiritual union, so close as to be fitly represented by the union of the wife to the husband, of the branch to the vine, of the member to the head, yea, so as to be one spirit. For so he will be united with you, if you accept of him. Would you have a Saviour that has given some great and extraordinary testimony of mercy and love to sinners, by something that he has done, as well as by what he says? And can you think or conceive of greater things than Christ has done? Was it not a great thing for him who was God, to take upon him human nature, to be not only God, but man thenceforward to all eternity? But would you look upon suffering for sinners to be a yet greater testimony of love to sinners, than merely doing, though it be ever so extraordinary a thing that he has done? And would you desire that a Saviour should suffer more than Christ has suffered for sinners? What is there wanting, or what would you add if you could, to make him more fit to be your Saviour? But further, to induce you to accept of Christ as your Saviour, consider two things particularly. 1. How much Christ appears as the Lamb of God in his invitations to you to come to him and trust in him. With what sweet grace and kindness does he, from time to time, call and invite you, as Proverbs 8.4, Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. And Isaiah 55, 1-3, through 3, quote, Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. End quote. How gracious is he here in inviting every one that thirsts, and in so repeating his invitation over and over, Come ye to the waters, come, buy and eat, yea, come. Mark the excellency of that entertainment which he invites you to accept of. Come, buy wine and milk. Your poverty, having nothing to pay for it, shall be no objection. Come, ye that hath no money, come without money and without price. What gracious arguments and expostulations he uses with you! Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread? and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. As much as to say, it is altogether needless for you to continue laboring and toiling for that which can never serve your turn, seeking rest in the world and in your own righteousness. I have made abundant provision for you of that which is really good, and will fully satisfy your desires, and answer your end and I stand ready to accept of you. You need not be afraid. If you will come to me, I will engage to see all your wants supplied, and you made a happy creature. As he promises in the third verse, Incline your ear and come unto me, hear and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. And so Proverbs 9 at the beginning. How gracious and sweet is the invitation there! Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. Let you never be so poor, ignorant, and blind a creature, you shall be welcome. And in the following words, Christ sets forth the provision that he has made for you. Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. You are in a poor famishing state, and have nothing wherewith to feed your perishing soul. You have been seeking something, yet remain destitute. Hearken how Christ calls you to eat of his bread, and to drink of the wine that he hath mingled. And how much like a lamb does Christ appear in Matthew nine twenty-eight to 30 Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. O oh, thou poor distressed soul! Whoever thou art, consider that Christ mentions thy very case when he calls to them who labor and are heavy laden, how he repeatedly promises you rest if you come to him. In the twenty-eighth verse he says, I will give you rest, and in the twenty-ninth verse, 
ye shall find rest to your souls. This is what you want. This is the thing that you have been so long in vain seeking after. Oh, how sweet would rest be to you if you could but obtain it. Come to Christ and you shall obtain it. And hear how Christ, to encourage you, represents himself as a lamb. He tells you that he is meek and lowly in heart, and are you afraid to come to such a one? And again, Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, and I will sup with him, and he with me. Christ condescends not only to call you to him, but he comes to you. He comes to your door, and there knocks. He might send an officer and seize you as a rebel and vile malefactor, but instead of that, he comes and knocks at your door, and seeks that you would receive him into your house as your friend and saviour. And he not only knocks at your door, but he stands there waiting, while you are backward and unwilling. And not only so, but he makes promises what he will do for you if you will admit him, what privileges he will admit you to. He will sup with you, and you with him. And again, Revelation 22, verses 16 and 17, I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. How does Christ here graciously set before you his own winning attractive excellency? And how does he condescend to declare to you not only his own invitation, but the invitation of the Spirit and the Bride, if by any means he might encourage you to come? And how does he invite every one that will, that they may take of the water of life freely, that they may take it as a free gift, however precious it be, though it be the water of life? 2. If you do come to Christ, he will appear as a lion, in his glorious power and dominion, to defend you. All those excellencies of his, in which he appears as a lion, shall be yours, and shall be employed for you in your defense, for your safety, and to promote your glory, he will be as a lion to fight against your enemies. He that touches you, or offends you, will provoke his wrath, as he that stirs up a lion." Unless your enemies can conquer this lion, they shall not be able to destroy or hurt you. Unless they are stronger than he, they shall not be able to hinder your happiness. Isaiah 31 verse 4, quote, For thus hath the Lord spoken unto me, Like as the lion and the young lion roaring on his prey, when a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor abase himself for the noise of them. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Mount Zion, and for the hill thereof. End quote. C. Let what has been said be improved to induce you to love the Lord Jesus Christ, and choose him for your friend and portion. As there is such an admirable meeting of diverse excellencies in Christ, so there is everything in him to render him worthy of your love and choice, and to win and engage it. Whatsoever there is or can be desirable in a friend is in Christ, and that to the highest degree that can be desired. Would you choose for a friend a person of great dignity? It is a thing taking with men to have those for their friends who are much above them, because they look upon themselves honored by the friendship of such. Thus how taking would it be with an inferior maid to be the object of the dear love of some great and excellent prince? but Christ is infinitely above you, and above all the princes of the earth, for he is the king of kings. So honorable a person as this offers himself to you in the nearest and dearest friendship. And would you choose to have a friend not only great, but good? In Christ, infinite greatness and infinite goodness meet together, and receive luster and glory one from another. His greatness is rendered lovely by his goodness. The greater any one is without goodness, so much the greater evil. But when infinite goodness is joined with greatness, it renders it a glorious and adorable greatness. So, on the other hand, his infinite goodness receives luster from his greatness. He that is of great understanding and ability, and is withal of a good and excellent disposition, 
is deservedly more esteemed than a lower and lesser being with the same kind inclination and good will. Indeed, goodness is excellent in whatever subject it be found. It is beauty and excellency itself, and renders all excellent that are possessed of it, and yet most excellent when joined with greatness. The very same excellent qualities of gold render the body in which they are inherent more precious and of greater value when joined with greater than when with lesser dimensions. And how glorious is the sight to see him who is the great creator and supreme lord of heaven and earth, full of condescension, tender pity and mercy, towards the mean and unworthy. His almighty power and infinite majesty and self-sufficiency render his exceeding love and grace the more surprising. And how do his condescension and compassion endear his majesty, power and dominion, and render those attributes pleasant that would otherwise be only terrible? Would you not desire that your friend, though great and honorable, should be of such condescension and grace, and so to have the way opened to free access to him, that his exaltation above you might not hinder your enjoyment of his friendship? And would you choose not only that the infinite greatness and majesty of your friend should be, as it were, mollified and sweetened with condescension and grace, but would you also desire to have your friend brought nearer to you? Would you choose a friend far above you, and yet, as it were, upon a level with you too? Though it be taking with men to have a near and dear friend of superior dignity, yet there is also an inclination in them to have their friend a sharer with them in circumstances. Thus is Christ. Though he be the great God, yet he has, as it were, brought himself down to be upon a level with you, so as to become man, as you are, that he might not only be your Lord, but your brother, and that he might be more fit to be a companion for such a worm of the dust. This is one end of Christ's taking upon him man's nature, that his people might be under advantages for a more familiar converse with him than the infinite distance of a divine nature would allow of. And upon this account the church longed for Christ's incarnation. Canticles 8 1. O oh, that thou wert my brother that sucked the breast of my mother! When I should find thee without, I would kiss thee, yea, I should not be despised. One design of God in the gospel is to bring us to make God the object of our undivided respect, that he may engross our regard every way, that whatever natural inclination there is in our souls, he may be the center of it, that God may be all in all. But there is an inclination in the creature, not only to the adoration of a Lord and Sovereign, but to complacence in some one as a friend, to love and delight in some one that may be conversed with as a companion. And virtue and holiness do not destroy or weaken this inclination of our nature. But so hath God contrived in the affair of our redemption, that a divine person may be the object even of this inclination of our nature. And in order here too, such a one is come down to us, and has taken our nature, and is become one of us, and calls himself our friend, brother, and companion. Psalm 122, verse 8. For my brethren and companion's sake, will I now say, Peace be within thee. But is it not enough, in order to invite and encourage you to free access to a friend so great and high, that he is one of infinite condescending grace, and also has taken your own nature, and is become man? But would you, further to embolden and win you, have him a man of wonderful meekness and humility. Why, such a one is Christ. He is not only become man for you, but far the meekest and most humble of all men, the greatest instance of these sweet virtues that ever was or will be. And besides these, he has all other human excellencies in the highest perfection. These, indeed, are no proper addition to his divine excellencies. Christ has no more excellency in his person, since his incarnation, than he had before. For divine excellency is infinite, and cannot be added to. Yet his human excellencies are additional manifestations of his glory and excellency to us, and are additional recommendations of him to our esteem and love, who are of finite comprehension. Though his human excellencies are but communications and reflections of his divine, and through this light, as reflected, falls infinitely short of the divine fountain of light in its immediate glory, 
yet the reflection shines not without its proper advantages as presented to our view and affection. The glory of Christ in the qualifications of his human nature appears to us in excellencies that are of our own kind, and are exercised in our own way and manner, and so, in some respect, are peculiarly fitted to invite our acquaintance and draw our affection. The glory of Christ as it appears in his divinity, though far brighter, more dazzles our eyes, and exceeds the strength of our sight or our comprehension. But, as it shines in the human excellencies of Christ, it is brought more to a level with our conceptions, and suitableness to our nature and manner, yet retaining a semblance of the same divine beauty, and a savor of the same divine sweetness. But as both divine and human excellencies meet together in Christ, they set off and recommend each other to us. It tends to endear the divine majesty and holiness of Christ to us, that these are attributes of one in our nature, one of us, who is become our brother, and is the meekest and humblest of men. It encourages us to look upon these divine perfections, however high and great, since we have some near concern in and liberty freely to enjoy them. And on the other hand, how much more glorious and surprising do the meekness, the humility, obedience, resignation, and other human excellencies of Christ appear, when we consider that they are in so great a person as the eternal Son of God, the Lord of heaven and earth. By your choosing Christ for your friend and portion, you will obtain these two infinite benefits. 1. Christ will give himself to you, with all those various excellencies that meet in him, to your full and everlasting enjoyment. He will ever after treat you as his dear friend, and you shall ere long be where he is, and shall behold his glory, and dwell with him, in most free and intimate communion and enjoyment. When the saints get to heaven, they shall not merely see Christ, and have to do with him as subjects and servants with a glorious and gracious Lord and Sovereign, but Christ will entertain them as friends and brethren. This we may learn from the manner of Christ's conversing with his disciples here on earth. Though he was their sovereign Lord, and did not refuse, but required, their supreme respect and adoration, yet he did not treat them as earthly sovereigns are wont to do with their subjects. He did not keep them at an awful distance, but all along conversed with them, with the most friendly familiarity, as a father amongst a company of children, yea, as with brethren. So he did with the twelve, and so he did with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He told his disciples that he did not call them servants, but friends, and we read of one of them that leaned on his bosom, and doubtless he will not treat his disciples with less freedom and endearment in heaven. He will not keep them at a greater distance for his being in a state of exaltation, but he will rather take them into a state of exaltation with him. This will be the improvement Christ will make of his own glory, to make his beloved friends partakers with him, to glorify them in his glory, as he says to his father, John seventeen twenty two and 23, And the glory which thou hast given me have I given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, etc. We are to consider that though Christ is greatly exalted, yet he is exalted not as a private person for himself only, but as his people's head. He is exalted in their name, and upon their account, as the first fruits, and as representing the whole harvest. He is not exalted that he may be at a greater distance from them, but that they may be exalted with him. The exaltation and honor of the head is not to make a greater distance between the head and the members, but the members have the same relation and union with the head they had before, and are honored with the head. And instead of the distance being greater, the union shall be nearer and more perfect. When believers get to heaven, Christ will conform them to himself, as he is set down in his Father's throne, so they shall sit down with him on his throne, and shall in their measure be made like him. When Christ was going to heaven, he comforted his disciples with the thought that after a while he would come again and take them to himself, that they might be with him. And we are not to suppose that when the disciples got to heaven, they found him keeping a greater distance than he used to do. No, doubtless, he embraced them as friends, and welcomed them to his and their father's house, 
and to his and their glory. They who had been his friends in this world, who had been together with him here, and had together partaken of sorrows and troubles, are now welcomed by him to rest, and to partake of glory with him. He took them and led them into his chambers, and showed them all his glory. As he prayed, John 17.24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me, that they may behold the glory which thou hast given me. And he led them to his living fountains of waters, and made them partake of his delights, as he prays, John 17.13, that my joy may be fulfilled in themselves, and set them down with him at his table in his kingdom, and made them partake with him of his dainties, according to his promise, Luke 22.30, and led them to his banqueting house, and made them to drink new wine with him in the kingdom of his heavenly Father, as he foretold them when he instituted the Lord's Supper, Matthew 26.29. Yea, the saints' conversation with Christ in heaven shall not only be as intimate, and their access to him as free, as of the disciples on earth, but in many respects much more so. For in heaven that vital union shall be perfect, which is exceeding imperfect here. While the saints are in this world, there are great remains of sin and darkness to separate or disunite them from Christ, which shall then all be removed. This is not a time for that full acquaintance, and those glorious manifestations of love, which Christ designs for his people hereafter, which seems to be signified by his speech to Mary Magdalene, when ready to embrace him when she met him after his resurrection, John twenty seventeen, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. When the saints shall see Christ's glory and exaltation in heaven, it will indeed possess their hearts with the greater admiration and adoring respect, but it will not awe them into any separation, but will serve only to heighten their surprise and joy when they find Christ condescending to admit them to such intimate access, and so freely and fully communicating himself to them. So that if we choose Christ for our friend and portion, we shall hereafter be so received to him that there shall be nothing to hinder the fullest enjoyment of him to the satisfying the utmost cravings of our souls. We may take our full swing at gratifying our spiritual appetite after these holy pleasures. Christ will then say, as in Canticles 5.1, Eat, O friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O beloved. And this shall be our entertainment to all eternity. There shall never be any end of this happiness, or anything to interrupt our enjoyment of it, or in the least to molest us in it. 2. By your being united with Christ, you will have a more glorious union with and enjoyment of God the Father than otherwise could be. For hereby the saints' relation to God becomes much nearer. They are the children of God in a higher manner than otherwise could be. For, being members of God's own Son, they are in a sort partakers of his relation to the Father. They are not only sons of God by regeneration, but by a kind of communion in the sonship of the eternal Son. This seems to be intended, Galatians 4, 4 to 6, quote, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, end quote. The church is the daughter of God, not only as he hath begotten her by his word and spirit, but as she is the spouse of his eternal Son. So we being members of the Son, are partakers in our measure of the Father's love to the Son, and complacence in him. John 17.23 I in them, and thou in me. Thou hast loved them, as thou hast loved me. And verse 26 That the love therewith thou hast loved me may be in them. In chapter 16, verse 27, The Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. So we shall, according to our capacities, be partakers of the Son's enjoyment of God, and have his joy fulfilled in ourselves. John 17:13. And by this means we shall come to an immensely higher, more intimate, and full enjoyment of God than otherwise could have been. 
for there is doubtless an infinite intimacy between the father and the son which is expressed by his being in the bosom of the father and saints being in him shall in their measure and manner partake with him in it and of the blessedness of it and thus the affair of our redemption ordered that thereby we are brought to an immensely more exalted kind of union with god and enjoyment of him both the father and the son than otherwise could have been for christ being united to the human nature we have advantage for a more free and full enjoyment of him than we could have had if he had remained only in the divine nature so again we being united to a divine person as his members can have a more intimate union and intercourse with god the father who is only in the divine nature than otherwise could be christ who is a divine person by taking on him our nature descends from the infinite distance and height above us and is brought nigh to us whereby we have advantage for the full enjoyment of him and on the other hand we by being in christ a divine person do as it were ascend up to god through the infinite distance and have thereby advantage for the full enjoyment of him also this was the design of christ that he and his father and his people might all be united in one john seventeen twenty one to twenty three quote, that they all may be one as thou father art in me and i in thee that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me and the glory which thou hast given me i have given them that they may be one even as we are one i in them and thou in me that they may be made perfect in one End quote. christ has brought it to pass that those whom the father has given him should be brought into the household of god that he and his father and his people should be as one society one family that the church should be as it were admitted into the society of the blessed trinity End of section 18